Uh, welcome to another Smart Digital Workshop where we stay motivated and rise together uh, by engaging in real conversations that enhance your personal and professional brand. Uh, my name is Dr. Theo Fowles and I'm joined by uh, my co-facilitator, uh, Dr. Jackie Thomas. Uh, in this episode, uh, we're going to be discussing trends around mental health on college campuses and the career paths of various kinds of helping professionals uh, in higher ed um, and the collegiate space as well. <clears throat> Our guests today um, are Dr. Eden uh, Agonifer and Kendra Archer. Uh, Dr. Agonifer has experience uh, working in community mental health. Uh, integrated medical centers, school-based counseling, and university uh, counseling centers. Uh, Kendra Archer uh, received her Master's of Social Work at Smith College uh, School for Social Work, and her interests uh, lie around crisis intervention, uh, cultural competence, and the list goes on and on. So we have uh, an amazing uh, group of folks to talk to today. So uh, let's go ahead and get started uh, with some questions. All right, let's pull these up. So <clears throat> the first, first question that we always like to, to um, have our guests answer is one, a little bit about yourself. So feel free to introduce yourself. Um, and the question that you'll answer first is, uh, describe the pathway uh, to the role that you currently have, um, and then describe what the typical route to, to this profession or this field is. So, uh, Dr. Agonifer, let's start with you, um, and then we'll pass it on to, to Kendra. All right, sounds good. Um, so again, my name is Dr. Aiden Agonifer. I am um, a, a clinical psychologist um, at USC, um, counseling mental health psychologist. Um, so a little bit about my pathway to this current role. Um, typically after undergrad, it requires anywhere from four to six years to get a doctoral degree in psychology. Uh, for me, it was a five-year journey. Um, so I went to grad school and earned two master's degrees, uh, one in clinical psychology, one in intercultural studies, and also a doctoral degree in clinical psychology. So during my uh, graduate studies, it was a lot of clinical work, research, um, and then uh, which ultimately led to me getting licensed and then um, getting a full-time job as a psychologist. And so that's sort of been my journey. As far as my background, as stated in my bio, um, I've done work in community mental health, um, in clinical settings or medical settings, um, school-based counseling, and then ultimately I ended up in um, college counseling centers uh, around three years ago. Um, so for now, this is my home. Um, and so it's been a really nice journey. So I was at USC in 2017 as a psychology intern, left to go complete my postdoctoral fellowship at Occidental College, and just returned uh, this September. Um, so I'm somewhat new to campus, I'm also not. Um, and so that's sort of been my journey. And as far as my multicultural coordinator role, um, just like Kendra, these topics are very personal and dear to us. And so um, and the work that we do is something that we tr truly try to emphasize in the systems that we belong in. So I applied for the role and got, got the multicultural coordinator role. So basically what I do with that is trying to train and educate um, staff, uh, primarily in-house, but sometimes um, outside of the counseling center around issues of um, diversity and cultural competency. And so that's sort of what um, I'll do. As far as the typical route for everyone, it's again, it's four to six years of grad school, clinical trainings uh, year after year, research and dissertation, as, as you all know. Um, and then from there, it's getting licensed and um, getting a job in various settings. So college counseling is an area um, that um, people can be in, but there are also other areas. So I have, I am relatively new to college mental health. Uh, I've been at USC for a little bit over a year, uh, but prior to that, um, I've been in the social work field for a little bit over a decade now. Um, I am a licensed clinical social worker, and typically the pathway to uh, that uh, career involves a four-year undergraduate degree, um, so that, you know, fundamentally can be pretty much um, in anything in terms of my um, 
my undergraduate degree was in Africana studies and education. And um, I got uh, my uh, master's in clinical social work at Smith College School for Social Work in Northampton, Massachusetts, which is a really uh, clinical psychodynamic based uh, social work program. And the mission of uh, social work is uh, typically oriented towards social justice and um, social policy. And, uh, and there's typically two tracks in social work. You can go into macro social work or you can go into clinical social work. And I chose to go into clinical social work. So, um, so it's a four year undergraduate degree, two years uh, for the MSW. And then to become a licensed clinical social worker, it ranges from state to state, but um, it can't. It typically is three to five years of uh, clinical work experience, psychotherapy, diagnosis under the supervision of another licensed clinical social worker. So after you've done the clinical uh, experience, which is ranges from two to three thousand hours of clinical work in the field, uh, you've had uh, supervision. You're eligible to sit for an exam uh, and. Um, passing that exam, then you get your licensure and you're eligible to um, open a private practice uh, and it opens up a lot uh, more uh, job opportunities in terms of being able to supervise uh, and being able to um, conduct therapy independently. So I did all of that work um, on the East Coast in New York where I'm from. Um, I did a lot of community-based uh, clinical social work. I've worked in uh, pediatric clinics, psychiatric hospitals, um, foster care, uh, and I've um, done work in homeless shelters, um, doing um, both clinical social work and also case management. Uh, and um, I chose college mental health um, because in the field um, at my last position, I saw a lot of um, Black and Latinx youth coming into our clinic, um, reporting that it was really difficult for them to access mental health services on their respective college campuses. So I recognized that there was a need in this field and, um, and I uh, had always been interested in working in college mental health. So it's been a journey and um, at USC, I'm currently um, on the crisis uh, leadership team. And um, so I, um, I uh, take uh, walk-ins that come into the clinic. Um, I also run a women of color support group, which has been growing recently. And um, we have women from um, undergraduate, um, graduate backgrounds, um, offering support and, um, you know, uh, to other women. And um, so it's, it's been an incredible journey. Awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> Kendra, we'll, we'll uh, continue with you for a second, um, just in terms of our next question, uh, which is, um, what professional organizations would you suggest to be a part of uh, within this field and why, right? Well, we have uh, lots of folks interested uh, in the field and how can they get connected professionally? Yeah, so I definitely recommend uh, joining NASW, the, the National Association for Social Workers. Um, as being part of that organization, uh, you, um, you can you know, form and build connections with other social workers. Uh, if you're working towards your clinical licensure, it's a good way of networking and finding a supervisor. Not all clinical settings uh, have qualified social workers to provide licensure. So it's a great way of networking, um, getting access to literature that's relevant in the field uh, and um, getting insurance, malpractice insurance. Uh, and I also, for black social workers, um, there's a national association for Black social workers, uh, which I also uh, recommend being part of as well. Um, so um, it's definitely important to network um, and to talk to other uh, clinicians and social workers in the field. And those are great ways of opening up your professional networks. And uh, Dr. Ogonifer, how about you? All right, so I would definitely say the American Psychological Association, which is a big national um, organization that has various chapters. So, of course, based on interest areas, um, you can join that. Uh, it tends to be pretty pricey, but it's cheaper for students, of course. Uh, there's also the California version. It's called California Psychological Association, and they also have a Los Angeles chapter. Um, so I'll recommend that. Um, so the last one I'll recommend for sure is the Associ 
the Association of Black Psychologists or ABSI. Um, I, I really believe this is a good home for black therapists or black psychologists just to be able to um, talk about the role of culture, the work we do, um, and just to brainstorm and, and be creative together. So that's another one I would definitely recommend. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, I always like to ask this question. Uh, Dr. O'Gonifer, we'll, we'll start with you on this question. Um, what advice would you give yourself if you were entering this field today, right? Sometimes we think about, hmm, what, what would we tell our old self? So if you were uh, giving advice to someone entering the field today, uh, what advice would you give them? That's a very good question. <laughs> I often encourage my clients to think about that. <laughs> you know, imagine 10 years from now, what would you tell yourself? So it's kind of similar. Uh, for me, I would definitely say brace yourself because you're going to come across uh, lots of challenges. Um, I think for me personally, being a high achieving person, I've always felt like I can do it. Whatever I put my mind to, I can achieve. And I definitely believe that's true. But sometimes what that does is when we come across barriers, it can be discouraging. And so looking back, I would definitely tell myself, um, you know, challenges are part of the process. Uh, it will work out and take good care of yourself. Um, I say this a lot. Oftentimes, I think we neglect um, our well-being and health when we're trying to achieve uh, something great for individually uh, or perhaps even for our communities and families. So it's really important that uh, we take good care of our health, uh, and that includes mental health. And so I'll definitely tell myself, you know, uh, practice holistic self-care, which I'll talk about later today. Uh, but that's what I would definitely tell myself. And, and Kendra, uh, your words of advice. <laughs> well, I would echo what um, Dr. Gonifer is, is uh, saying as well. It's really important to practice really good self-care and um, being patient with yourself, being kind to yourself, which is which are also messages that I stress uh, to the clients that I work with. Um, oftentimes the clients that I work with and, and I identify with that being a high achieving um, person, being a perfectionist, um, being a black woman and navigating uh, professional spaces that uh, often feeling as though having to perform 110% um, going beyond and really putting a lot of pressure uh, on uh, oneself can be really draining and it's important to have longevity in your career and um, to be able to have your um, yourself uh, fulfilled spiritually, mentally, emotionally, um, and when you're not at work. Uh, and so it's important to find a couple of activities, social networks, um, spiritual activities, whatever it is um, to, um, to fill, fill yourself and to make yourself whole so that you can step out into that field because it is a very challenging field. Um, and I will say particularly for um, Black social workers, um, it can be, um, I would encourage, um, if I could talk to myself 10 years ago, I would tell myself to advocate for myself as well as I advocate for my clients um, in terms of advocating for um, leadership opportunities within your organization, um, advocating for those clinical hours, which can be really difficult um, to come by and having good supervision, which is really important um, as you are um, doing a very difficult work and working with marginalized populations and um, difficult mental health um, challenges that um, you will work with. So yeah, definitely self-care, self-advocacy, and, um, and being patient and kind with yourself. Wise words, wise words. Um, <clears throat> so before we get into uh, a deep dive of some really specific questions to, uh, to your work, um, the last question I have for, you, for both of you is, uh, what do you wish other higher ed professionals knew about your role uh, or your job? And how do you think uh, these professionals can collaborate with you better? Uh, let's start with Kendra on this one. Well, I, you know, having worked in college mental health for the past year, I, I think that um, 
everyone is well-meaning in terms of wanting to um, provide the resources for students and to get them the help that they need. Um, but one thing that I wish that um, some of my partners understood is um, how much it really takes to provide the type of quality care that we do uh, and how much time it takes and how much collaboration it takes um, and to do quality work. Um, and of, oftentimes to really um, meeting the clients where they're at too and, and respecting their self-determination. Um, so, you know, and I wish that they also knew the challenges like outside of the college mental health setting in terms of the community and getting, um, you know, individuals connected to a higher level of care when they need it. Um, and so, you know, how um, short resourced it is outside of campus. And so I just wish that they better understood some of the challenges and I just wish that there was more time to collaborate. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's challenging, it's good work, um, but definitely I wish there was more collaboration. And we'll pass it over to you, Dr. Adonifer. All right, so I echo the same thing. Kendra and I, as you know, we work together. Uh, one thing I'll definitely say is, and this is for all of us, mental health is very important. Um, I can't emphasize this enough. Um, and, you know, we're just now coming to grips with the fact that it's important because we're there's a national crisis, right? Not just in colleges, but all around. Um, the same way multiculturalism is very important. You know, our day-to-day -day experiences matter, especially uh, when we have intersecting identities. And so I want all of my, you know, higher ed colleagues and partners to know that. The main thing I want to highlight is mental health is a community effort, you know. Um, everyone is responsible for this, not just mental health professionals. And what I mean by that is not everything is clinical. And I know uh, most folks kind of wonder like, what can I say and do? And then when should I refer them to counseling? So it's really important, first of all, for us to understand that there has to be this community of care, right? We're all checking in with one another. Uh, we're all encouraging and uplifting one another. So it starts with that. Um, and then from there, we have to determine, you know, how do we get people connected to the right resources like uh, counseling support and such. Um, so the main thing I just really want to highlight is, you know, we should all pause and check in with one another um, and collaborate together. Um, I know we're all in this. We, we care very deeply about our students. Um, so a lot of us are already doing this work. It's nothing new. Uh, but the main thing I'll definitely highlight is uh, we can also continue to collaborate, kind of like what Kendra mentioned, being intentional by maybe um, co-hosting events together. Um, like we do this now with, you know, student orgs or academic units, but um, as long as we continue to do that, uh, we will know what the other is doing. So it doesn't feel like we're all siloed, but that we're all working together to uh, improve everyone's health. I'm going to jump in. I have some more um, industry specific questions. Um, about your experiences. So first I'm wondering, what it, how would you describe the common experience of black mental health professionals on a college campus, whether that's social work or psychology? And if we can start with you, Ms. Archer, that would be great. Yeah, I, I think um, that one thing that I'm, that I'm finding is that there aren't um, enough of us, there aren't enough um, black mental health professionals in spaces where we're needed. And so oftentimes, um, I think a lot of the, um, the pressure in terms of being able to take on um, clients um, falls on uh, the people that are in these settings. And um, because we're, you know, I think one thing that has been challenging is college mental health settings kind of recognizing the need to bring in diversity and um, because this is what the student body is expecting uh, and um, you know there are un unique um, competencies um, that um, clinicians of color offer or can offer and so I think that it's it's it had it comes with its challenges in terms of being um, working in a setting where there aren't enough um, 
of you there. And um, in terms of professionally, um, you know, it's doing a lot of educating and a lot of representing. Um, and so that, that has been the challenge that I found, um, you know, that there, that there needs to be more diversity. And I, I think also the um, responsibility tends to fall on the clinicians of color to advocate for that and to have your voice heard in that arena. Uh, and so um, that's been my experience. What are some of the mental health trends that you're seeing on campuses, on your campus? Um, and that's for all students, but also for black students in particular. And how is that affecting your work? And if we can start with you, Dr. Agonifer. Okay. Um, so in general, the trends tend to be uh, a lot of students are lonely or they're feeling lonely in this particular time of their life. Because um, as you know, it's the developmental stage where they're trying to understand relationships and love and all these things. So uh, most students tend to feel lonely and isolated and USC in and of itself presents a unique challenge uh, for all students. Um, there's sadness, there's overwhelming stress and anxiety that uh, is sometimes related to academic functioning, but sometimes it's also related to family. Uh, there are financial concerns, um, as you know, at least at USC. It's a very expensive school to go to, uh, but increasingly we're seeing that a lot of students are stressed and trying to figure out how to pay for college. There are identity related issues that come up during this stage. Um, there's classism issue, there's imposter syndrome, and recently we're starting to see a lot of um, students who are experiencing homelessness and just don't have their basic needs met. So if they can't even have that, then how are we expecting them to perform at a high level? And so these are sort of the typical trends across many colleges, I would say. Uh, for Black students in specific, you have all of these things in addition to microaggressions, racism, trauma, feeling like they don't belong. Um, the imposter syndrome is always there. And so again, the in experience of inequity on an ongoing basis day to day, not just in college, but outside of college. So uh, it tends to be very challenging. And so again, with that, uh, at least what I see is that when students can have a space on campus where they feel safe, when they, where they feel heard, it's important. So that's why I really appreciate CBCSA and the other cultural centers, because at least there's a space on campus where students feel like they belong and that they matter. And so um, I think community support could really be helpful in some of these things. I, I would say, you know, similarly to Aiden, I, I've seen, um, particularly um, amongst all college students, uh, concerns around identity uh, and, you know, who am I, um, you know, as they're um, entering into um, and they're in the midst of uh, young adulthood, um, who am I outside of my family context, outside of my community context. Um, they're developing um, a sense of themselves. They're figuring out, um, you know, their racial identity, they're figuring out their gender identity, uh, and a lot of uh, a spectrum of different identity issues. Um, in terms of uh, mental health diagnoses, uh, we're seeing a lot of anxiety. Um, you know, students are coming in with panic attacks, a lot of academic related um, stress, uh, and um, they're having a difficult time um, really coping with um, the pressures of being in an academic setting. And for a lot of these students, particularly students at USC, these are students who had been used to being high achieving in their um, high school settings. And so for the first time, they're in a setting of a lot of very talented students and they're trying to figure themselves out in the midst of that. Uh, and so, you know, we see anxiety, we see depression, we're seeing rising rates of suicidality on uh, college campuses. And, um, you know, when suicides happen, um, you know, there, there can be a contagion effect of uh, a ripple effect of other people who, you know, have heard about it, have known someone um, who's experienced um, suicide or has been touched by it. Uh, and we see um, eating disorders. Uh, and sometimes, you know, we even see, um, you know, severe and persistent mental health issues presenting for the first time, bipolar disorder, mania, psychosis. Um, and, you know, that was one of the things that surprised me when I, um, you know, started uh, at USC about a year ago, how, how 
um, how often that can come up um, with students. So um, in addition to students of color, like Aiden said, um, we're thinking about all of these mental health issues in addition to um, marginalization, microaggressions, uh, and um, really imposter syndrome, feeling alone, feeling like they don't belong, um, really searching for a community and searching for mentorship. Uh, and, um, you know, we live uh, in a day and age with social media. And so uh, I think that has an impact on, um, you know, our students feeling comfortable socially and, you know, having the experience of, of being able to navigate um, you know, starting conversations with people. And so, you know, I think that that's something that um, has also been presenting. And I, and so in terms of for students of color, it's really important for them to have um, mentors and people that they can turn to, um, that can normalize their experience, that can point them in the direction of, you know, here's this, you know, professor that you can talk to about this career that you've been thinking about. Here's this internship opportunity that would be really helpful. Um, so, you know, that um, it tends to be really um, important and um, something that students of color um, can struggle with in terms of um, finding that support and, and community on campus. Awesome, thank you. Yes. Um, so my next question, uh, I'm wondering if you have noticed any mental health trends um, or struggles that Black alumni or Black professionals have um, been experiencing because just because someone has finished their degrees doesn't mean they're magically well, right? So I'm wondering if you are seeing anything with the Black staff that you're encountering on campus, um, others, other Black people in your circles, and just maybe even the Black alumni that come back to USC. And if we can start with you, Ms. Archer. I think one thing that has come up a lot um, with the clients that I've seen primarily with the graduate students uh, is having, um, I've met with, you know, so many students that have struggled with, um, you know, finding support within their departments, um, finding good mentorship. Um, the relationship with, with an advisor can be really important in terms of making or breaking a student's career uh, and being able to finish a dissertation or a thesis or finishing their research. research. And so I've encountered uh, students who report that they experience microaggressions, um, that, they, that there's a lot of barriers, that they um, have really struggled with um, they, they tend to advocate for themselves, but in terms of finding allies, um, it has been uh, challenging. And so, um, you know, in, in terms of that, uh, it tends to be really helpful to, um, from a clinical perspective, uh, to also work with clients around um, ways that they can connect with other departments on campus that can be helpful, um, ways that they can work on self-advocacy uh, and, um, because it, it, you know, for, for graduate students, I, particularly black um, graduate students, I, I hear a lot about um, really struggling to um, form connections within their departments and, and having support, adequate support. Thank you. And Dr. Agonifer, do you have any thoughts on that question? I mean, I would say probably a lot of the challenges that black alumni or or faculty and staff have faced in the past, certainly some things they still face with or deal with, right? Uh, that includes work stressors, just general life stress, health-related financial. And so we carry these things with us um, year after year and season after season, I think for the most part. Uh, but I'll definitely say is I think if staff happen to be in the department or an academic unit where it's only one or two black staff, um, that can create some sense of isolation, right? Again, not having the support um, and just in general, having to deal with the microaggressions that, that come with being a black individual. And so, um, yeah, my guess is they probably still experience some of these things, but um, the older you get or the more resources you have, you're sort of able to cope with them differently. 
than let's say when someone is young, that's someone that's 18 or 19. And so, um, yeah, and, and I think these things could definitely take a toll on uh, a person's mental health and physical health. And so that's when um, typically people speak up a lot of times. Otherwise, um, there's not a lot of conversation around what it means to be black and to navigate different spaces. Thank you. And uh, my last question is, how do you practice self-care and how do you balance your roles and your responsibilities? Um, I know often as mental health professionals, people think that you have all the answers and you're doing all the things and that may or may not be true, but um, where, where are you in your, your self-care um, and balance, life work balance journeys? And if we could start with you, Dr. Agonifer. So as I stated earlier, I'm a huge advocate of self-care. Um, I That's something personal and also professional. And so um, I, I feel like I every student I come across, whether it's in a clinical setting or not, I talk to them about the importance of approaching um, self-care or health from a holistic, holistic perspective. Um, and some of that is really looking at six dimensions of self-care. So there's the physical, psychological, emotional, spiritual, Kendra highlighted that earlier, uh, social, and then academic or professional. So uh, each of these areas really need to be tended to. And oftentimes as professionals, we may just focus so much on the professional piece and may neglect the physical self-care part uh, or the psychological, emotional. And so it's a constant effort to balance things out. Um, season after season, depending on what kind of demands we have. Um, and so for me, again, I, I really try to highlight this with clients and students. So in doing that, I have to practice what I preach. So making sure that I take the time out to do that. So what that looks like for me is I really try to leave work at work. Um, so once I clock out, you know, at, at 6.30, 7 o'clock, I don't go home trying to do notes or to really keep thinking about a client or a case. It's just knowing that some things need to uh, be, you know, be left at work when they need to, unless, uh, you know, there's a need for me to follow up on something. Um, I try to remain active, uh, you know, exercise. I try to go to the gym three to four days a week. I seek support from my spiritual community, um, hang out with friends. Um, the biggest thing for me in this season of life has been embracing challenge um, knowing, you know, what kind of change need to occur. Not only that, what's within my control, what's not. I think that's, there's wisdom in knowing uh, what can I change? And then what are those things that um, uh, I can still advocate, but kind of, you know, leave for the sake of um, having sanity. And so uh, that's an ongoing um, effort in trying to understand what's, you know, again, what's, what's my demand and what resources do I have to, um, to tackle those demands. And so, uh, balance is key is what I would say. And Ms. Archer, your self-care and your balance. Yeah, I, um, you know, I, I really appreciate uh, what Dr. Gonifer had to say about the different dimensions of self-care, um, because I feel like uh, oftentimes we neglect um, the, um, you know, the spiritual aspect of it. Um, and um, you know, other uh, areas outside of our work life. Uh, and so I think it's really important to have um, really good work-life balance. Uh, as Dr. Gonifer shared, leaving, I make it uh, really a, a practice to leave the work there. When I leave, I, I don't often think about the work um, or clients when I'm, you know, outside of work. And that is really to provide uh, preserve my sacred space in terms of being able to um, feel fulfilled. Um, and so that when I come back to work, I'm refreshed um, and I can um, engage in the clinical work in a meaningful way. And so what's really has been critical for me is that even well into my career, I also still have a mentor. Uh, and so um, there um, is a uh, 
uh, she's an older uh, woman and she's a psychiatrist and she's been uh, in the mental health field for decades. And it's really important for me to be able to talk to her about what, what works for her in terms of her self-care uh, and um, to be able to kind of process my experience as uh, a Black woman in this field. Uh, and it's been really uh, critical and um, important for me to have that support and mentorship. Um, I also have a spiritual community, uh, which I'm really passionate about and uh, connected to. Um, I stay connected to friends and family. I also um, have been mindful about um, eating well and taking care of myself. Uh, and so I really, you know, when it comes to my clients, I really um, provide a supportive space for uh, for my clients to imagine ways that they can take care of themselves um, and um, to really uh, stress that their self-care regimen is a toolkit that they can add to and and build on over time and that 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 toolkit might look different in different seasons of their lives as they grow as individuals and as they um, develop their interests in, in new ways and so um, I definitely stress um, self-care and I think it's important. Thank you. I actually have one more question. We have a little more time and a lot of graduate students will watch these webinars from time to time. And one thing that uh, Theo and I always talk about is um, trying to help people figure out, well, graduate students as well as undergraduate students who are interested in working at a college but aren't sure what the options are. It's very murky when you're trying to figure that out. Um, so I'm wondering how you chose your degrees and um, what, uh, I don't know the best way to say this, but like what options are available to a professional once they enter the field that you're in on a college campus with your degree? So what types of things can be done? And actually, if we can start with you, Ms. Archer. So my, my journey towards my um, career was um, a conversation that I had with a um, black psychologist and, um, you know, who taught me um, in undergrad. And I, I talked to her about my professional interests, which was to work with marginalized communities. And I saw myself working in school based settings. Um, but I also wanted to have a variety of different experiences in terms of working in um, in clinics, in um, all of the settings that I've ended up working in, like, you know, I shared that with her. Uh, and um, I told her, like, that it was really important for me to have experience in the field full time. And I wasn't really interested in um, a lot of, you know, the research aspect of, um, you know, um, psychology. And so I was more so interested in like grassroots, um, you know, set, you know, settings and working in organizations and working um, and, and working towards empowering marginalized communities. And so, you know, I was moved towards social work because of that focus. Uh, and um, in terms of, um, you know, the path in uh, college uh, mental health settings, social workers are trained um, in a variety of different areas. Um, like I mentioned, um, a lot of social work programs tend to um, have two tracks, macro and clinical. Um, but if you're in a clinical track, you can also take more um, policy oriented classes. Um, there's also social work schools that offer um, social entrepreneurship classes. And so you can really, you know, social workers are also trained in terms of being able to um, see the person as a whole person in terms of person in their environment. Uh, and so on college campuses, you know, social workers can be academic advisors, they can be therapists, um, they can take on multicultural coordinator roles. Um, and um, there's a wide breadth of uh, what social workers can do. They can teach, they can be clinical instructors. Um, as part of uh, clinical social work programs, there's a field uh, work component of it. Uh, and so you can be a uh, supervisor, um, you can work um, within social work programs to be a coordinator of field work. Um, so going out and 
looking for and building connections in the community, building connections with agencies uh, to create internship opportunities for other social workers pursuing their uh, graduate degrees. And so there's a wide breadth of uh, different opportunities. Um, social workers can do anything. Um, and it's about you uh, blazing your own path, making connections, um, finding what interests you, and um, you know, the sky's the limit. All right, and Dr. Ganifer, the, the clinical psychology route. Yes, so um, I didn't get to share a little bit about my undergrad journey. So my degree was not in psychology for undergrad. It was in human development and family sciences, which is kind of a sister field to psychology, more from a natural science perspective. And so um, I was not familiar with psychology until I applied for grad school. Um, the thing about psychology is there are different types of psychologists. So for example, there's clinical psychologists, counseling psychologists, um, industrial and organization psychologists, educational psychologists, so there are all types of psychologists out there, um, and there are different tracks that are required or different um, years of completion. And so for me, I chose the clinical very much like Kendra. Uh, when I was in college, I worked with um, a lot of um, middle school and high school students um, as a mentor and as a tutor uh, for this agency that um, I had a part-time job with. And so in that work, a lot of my clients or students at the time were Black students and Latinx students, so the more I sat with them to tutor them, um, I started to really get an idea of their day-to-day -day struggles. And so for me, uh, my passion of psychology was actually birthed out of that experience and wanting to really be present clinically and not just doing the research, but not applying it um, in the work that I do. So I was more interested in that, so I went, I took the clinical route. In that, there's a PhD in the PsyD program PhD is more research focused, where PsyD, although we do research, again, is still clinically focused. And so that's how I made my decision. I chose a doctoral degree because it offers a variety of options. Uh, kind of like Kendra, um, there is the opportunity to work in different settings. Like, for example, you can do uh, community mental health, um, medical clinics or settings, there's hospitals, there's college counseling, there's private practice. So again, you have the options to do any of those, which is similar to uh, Kendra's field. Uh, from that, I think what, what separates us a little bit is the research opportunity, uh, being able to engage in a lot of applied research um, and using that research to guide our practices. Um, and then the other piece that's unique is we, as psychologists, um, have extensive training in neuropsychological assessment. Um, so this is where we sort of do a, a, a bigger, um, uh, assessment that requires different batteries uh, of tests to determine a person's functioning um, and what they need from there. So that's another opportunity. Um, so I really like that aspect. Uh, we also can do consulting work um, in general and consulting with um, different agencies, uh, also setting up our own consulting firm uh, on a specific topic like multiculturalism and things like that. Um, and then apart from that, the last is just public speaking. So my degree sort of offered me um, a lot of exposure to different things. And I thought if I get tired of the clinical, I can move on to maybe the research and teaching uh, or can really do part time in, in all these different areas and feel like I have uh, more of a um, fulfilled work. Ms. Archer and Dr. Aganifer, are there any questions you feel like we didn't ask or anything that you want to add? I definitely would say, um, as you know, as I mentioned earlier, there is a national mental health crisis for, for lots of different reasons. Um, and so there's a high demand uh, for mental health services across the board, but especially in college campuses. Um, and we unfortunately don't have the resource needed to meet the current demand. Um, so that does impact um, the way we do our work. Uh, it presents a challenge for each of us to be very um, creative and to constantly adapt um, to the changes that are happening is definitely creating a lot of challenges for uh, counseling center directors and leaders um, and thinking about uh, what models we use in terms of work, uh, how many therapy sessions can students get, um, what kind of crisis services do we provide. I mean, all these things are really in question right now across the board. And so I think as a result of that, 
uh, it could be challenging for us, but um, just very grateful. Although I'm fairly new to USC, we're still in the process of really um, talking together um, and trying to decide, you know, what what's helpful. Uh, but there are definitely challenges that we're facing as uh, mental health professionals at this time. I think I, I definitely agree with that um, in terms of the trends that we're seeing. Um, we're seeing a really high demand for um, mental health services and a high utilization of mental health services, which is fantastic. Um, you know, that means that, um, you know, the, um, the younger generation, our society is moving towards um, reducing the stigma around um, accessing care, around talking about these difficult issues. Um, and uh, in terms of trends that we're we're seeing um, during my time uh, at USC, I've seen a lot of uh, students, um, students of color, black students, um, more and more utilizing mental health services. I think that some um, programs that have been really helpful uh, is the Let's Talk program that we have, uh, which uh, are informal drop-in sessions uh, that are provided um, in various different um, organizations and centers on campus. Uh, so um, I'm a part of the Let's Talk program at the cultural centers. Uh, and so um, that's a great way to kind of get the word out and to give people a little bit of an experience of what it's like talking to a, a mental health counselor and what are the types of concerns to talk about and really um, working towards destigmatizing mental health um, issues. So, um, you know, definitely the challenge is that um, along with the growing trend in higher utilization of services is like Dr. Ganifer said, uh, college campus centers, uh, co college camp counseling centers are moving towards having to adjust their models and figure out how to um, better provide services and how to uh, expand and become more efficient with service delivery. This has been uh, really amazing. I'm really excited to have had the opportunity to talk to you both. Uh, this has been another episode uh, in the Smart Digital Workshop series. I want to thank you for your participation. Uh, this episode will be edited and shared across multiple platforms, uh, including Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and SoundCloud. Um, and as participants and our future guests as well, uh, you'll receive the first notice of its availability. So uh, we just want to let you know that. Uh, we're really excited again to have uh, each of you on today. Uh, and feel free to, uh, to share uh, this with others as it, as it, um, as it.